16-year-old boy took a rifle and shot a 38-year-old man seven times and left him lying dead by the side of the road. This man left behind a, a wife, a 19-year-old daughter, an 18-year-old son, a 15-year-old son, a 12-year-old son, a 10-year-old daughter, an 8-year-old daughter, five-year-old daughter, a three-year-old son, and an 18-month-old son. The 19-year-old daughter had graduated from high school and had moved away to New York, and the mother was left to raise the other kids by herself, five of whom were boys. The 19-year-old daughter was contacted and, and told that her father had been killed, and she made known that she would be there as soon as possible, but the day before the funeral, she had not arrived, and you can imagine what this family was going through, grieving the father, father's loss, but now concerned about the daughter. The day of the funeral, the, the daughter still had not arrived. Later, she contacted the family to let them know that she had miscarried on the bus on the way from New York and had to be returned for medical attention. And you can imagine what this family went through. But I can only imagine because I am that three-year-old son. My situation of growing up in poverty perhaps influenced my aspirations of becoming a medical doctor. And I was well on my way until my junior year in college when I was involved in a head-on collision. This head-on collision was not the result of an accident, but rather an incident that I had. And this incident occurred as I was trafficking through 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I came, had a head-on collision with life and, and death. It was not that most popular verse in the chapter, verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have become, uh, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Nor was it that theological verse 21, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. But rather it was that practical verse, verse 15, that said, and Christ died so that those of us who live may no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again in our behalf. And so when I read that verse, it was as though the, the Holy Spirit just sort of mugged me and I realized that I was living for myself, though a Christian, Though a committed Christian, I was the one calling all the shots for my life. But that particular day, I realized that Christ had died for him, for me, and I was to live for him. And so God brought three areas of my life before me. One was my career. I had told God that I would be a good medical doctor, but on that particular day, God reminded me that I had not asked him what it is that he would have me to be. And so I built an altar in my mind, and I, I placed my career on it. And I told God that if he wanted to take that and, and consume it, it was his choice. Or if he wanted to take it and bless it and give it back to me, the choice was his. Another area of my life came before me, and it was my mar marital status. I wasn't dating at the time, but I always had in the back of my mind that I would get married. But on that particular day, I laid my marital status on that altar. I said, God, if you want me to be single for the rest of my life, then single I will be. And then that was a third area, and that was where I would live. 
I had seen a missionary film when I was age 14 that had the opposite effect on me than it was in, intended to have. And in that, uh, in that video, there were some missionaries serving in Africa, and they were having a very difficult time. And I said to myself that if I ever said Jesus is Lord of my life, gave everything over to him, that he would send me straight to Africa, and I would suffer like those missionaries. But on that particular day, I said, God, whatever you would have me to do, wherever you would have me to go, the decision is yours. And so about 13 months later, I went to my mailbox, and that was a certified letter, and I opened it, and it said that I had been accepted to medical school. And the lightning didn't flash, and the thunder didn't roll. And I knew something had happened within me. And so I called a friend in Atlanta and told him what had happened and asked him to pray with me. And about six weeks later, I called the medical school and told them that I would not be coming. About 15 months later, there was a girl that I had known for three years who just became so beautiful to me. And to make a long story short, I'm wearing a ring, and we have been married for almost 33 years, and we have five children. So that's how that marital status turned out. And then where we would live, as you know, I am here, and God called us to start a church, not in Africa, but in Dothan, Alabama. And so we moved here in 19. 87 and began Dothan Community Church in 1988. And so I'm glad to be here with you this morning. Uh, sometimes God does things at the level of our hearts, and uh, he has sort of uh, given me a kindred spirit and has sort of knitted my heart to your pastor. I appreciate him, and, and I love him. He's a man of God, and he's been a good brother to me. And so I'm very thankful to be here and to share God's word with you this morning. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. A few decades ago... Um, that was a television series that was, has been uh, described as one of the greatest television series of all times. It's a standout in that it, it ran for five consecutive years at the top, the very top of the Nielsen ratings. That series is called All in the Family. Those of us who have a little age on us, uh, we know of Archie Bunker and Edith. And that series dealt with some issues that the general public didn't deal with, at least not uh, publicly. One of those issues that it dealt with was race and racism. One of the last things that we want to talk about in public, especially among people of different color. Well, this morning I want to share about all in the family and that from the word of God. All in the family. How do we as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and as the body of Christ live? The scripture gives some very specific information, some very significant truth, some very significant theology as to how the body of Christ is made up of all people, of all colors. And that that is the expressed purpose.
purpose and doing of God. And so I want to share from this passage three thoughts with you. And I hope to package it so that you can take it home with you and mull over it over the days and the weeks to come. So all in the family. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. So all in the family, the first prescription that is given is the family practice, the family practice. And the family practice is perseverance, perseverance. It says in verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Now, each word in this verse, in verse 2, is a word that suggests that there could be some, some tension, some not getting along. If these words, if these thoughts, if these ideas are not practiced, with all humility, that is, not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. It means to have a, a, a proper estimate of who you really are. It's to make yourself low rather than high. And so for living with all in the family, there must be humility. There must be gentleness, being kind to one another. Not always ready to engage in a brawl. Being patient. Suffering long with a person. Showing tolerance, having a, having a long fuse rather than a short one. We live in a society in a context where we don't often show humility and gentleness and patience and tolerance with one another. Certainly not in love. But when you read verse 2, these are the same ingredients that are necessary to live as a part of any family. I'm, I'm a part of a family of seven, a wife and four children, five children. And so in the humility... Gentleness, patience, tolerance is necessary. Each one is different. And if we want to get along rather than get it on, we have to practice these things. Paul is saying that the body of Christ, in the body of Christ, particularly Jew and Gentile, these things are necessary to get along. So the family practice is perseverance. When I was in college, I was involved with a ministry called the Navigators, and um, the summer after my junior year, we went to Atlanta for a uh, discipleship training program. And so um, they didn't tell us, but they had purposefully uh, gotten together students from historically black universities and, and uh, colleges 
that had primarily white students. So I attended Tuskegee University, a primarily black college. There were students from Morehouse College uh, in Atlanta, Morris Brown, all historically black universities. But there were students from Georgia Tech, uh, the University of Georgia, Agnes Scott College. Uh, and we got together and we began to live together. And when we got together, initially we were so kind and so polite. And uh, one day after work, uh, the guys in our dorm were wrestling. And uh, these are black guys and white guys wrestling. And one of the white guys said to another white guy concerning a black guy, throw him on the nigger pile. And when he said that, it's like a war broke out. But it was through that that we stopped being so kind and stopped being so polite and started talking about life. And when we left, we were brothers, sisters, because we dealt with the, the real issues of how do we live together. And then we began to practice humility and gentleness and patience and tolerance with one another in love. The family practice is perseverance. Then there is the family goal. The family goal. And the family goal is preservation. Verse 3. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Being diligent to preserve. Now, you cannot preserve something that you don't have. So this verse says that the unity of the Spirit is already there. It's already there. The Holy Spirit of God has placed it there. The Holy Spirit of God has brought it about. And so the church, the body of Christ, is to be diligent to preserve it in the bond of peace. And so in the passage that was read earlier from Ephesians chapter 2, we see how the unity came about. I want to read that passage again. It says, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both 
have our access in one spirit to the Father. The unity is already there. The Holy Spirit has brought it about. We, the body of Christ, the church, is to be diligent. The word means to labor, to work hard at, to expend energy. We're to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. When I read Ephesians 2, 11 through 18, I can substitute Gentile and Jew for black and white in my experience. Because I see the same things that were happening among the Gentiles and the Jews as a boy growing up, they were happening in, in my context. They were happening in the context of, of America. Chapter 2, verse 3, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called on circumcision, that was name-calling in verse 11, and that was name-calling when I was growing up. And that's still name-calling today. Verse 12, it says, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. In my context of growing up, that was separation and exclusion and strangers. I still remember the, the cafe that had whites only on this side, blacks only on this side, and the kitchen right in between them. And so when it talks about the two being made into one, I can relate to that. I suspect that you could too. The scripture says in verse 4, in chapter 4, verse 3, that we are to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. That was a time of separation. That was a time of exclusion, but through the blood of Christ, the two groups were made into one. And thus, we are to work hard at preserving the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The, the verse ab above says, in love, verse 3 says, of peace. We are to work at the family practice in love. We are to endeavor to preserve the unity of the Spirit in peace. In peace. Work hard at it. Be, 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 diligent, be diligent to preserve. Do you know that I see just the opposite in our practice? We, we are diligent to preserve our own cultures. We are, we are diligent to preserve and keep things the way we want them. And so the, the coming together that God has brought by the Spirit, we don't work for that, typically. We work to keep things the way they were. We work to keep them separate. We work to keep exclusion. You see, I've figured it out. I've figured out why Sunday morning is, is one of the most segregated times of the week. I figured it out. When we go and buy a car, they take a picture of us, and then they put a computer chip in the car. And so that if you are black, your car drives you to a black congregation on Sunday mornings. 
And if you're white, your car drives you to a white car. That's the only reason I, can ex- I have to explain for it. Because we wouldn't, we as God-fearing children of God, wouldn't just automatically do that. It's got to be the computer chip. Because the scripture says we are to be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The family practice is perseverance. The family goal is preservation. But then there's the family fact, the family fact, and that's perspective. And the perspective is one, O-N-E, one, one, verses four through six. There's one body and one spirit. Just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I think he's trying to make a point. He keeps saying one. There is one body, not two, not three, not four, not five. One, one body. And we're all part of it. There's one spirit. I don't have a black Holy Spirit in me, and David doesn't have a a white Holy Spirit in him. There's one spirit. Just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One hope. There's one Lord. One Lord. There's only one who died for us. There's one faith. There's one baptism. There is one God. One Father. Now, if we have one God, if 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 the one God is the one Father, then that means that all of us in here, brothers and sisters, if we are in Christ. And so you have a you have somebody of a few of the brothers and sisters of the lighter hue and a few like wa of the darker hue. But we are all brothers and sisters in Christ because we have one father. And he is he is the father of all, who is over all. And through all and in all. See, God has fixed this thing. God has worked this thing out so that if we wanted it to work, it could work. We have to work against it for it not to work. Which leads us back to the family practice. There has to be humility. There has to be gentleness. There has to be patience. We have to show tolerance to one another in love because our goal is to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. See, David did the same thing that Paul Thompson did and Ray Jones did when I went to preach at their churches. He gave me a Caucasian mic. <laughs> so when he comes to Dothan Community Church, I'm going to give him an African-American mic. <laughs> But 
there were two men who were traveling, one black, one white. And the white guy said to the black guy, he said, man, look, look at God's creation. He said, God is, God is so creative. Just look at the mountains. Look, look at the flowers. He says, you know, the, the white man is creative just like God. God's got to be white. And the black guy said, dude, dude, you're thinking on the, on the wrong level. Haven't you read in Revelation about heaven? All of the music and singing in heaven, there's rhythm in heaven, and only black folks can do that. God's got to be black. So as they drove down the road, they kept saying, you know, he's black, he's white. He's black, he's white. And they came to a curve, and they missed the curve. They had a fatal accident. And they woke up in heaven, and they met Peter, and they said, Peter, right before we got here, we were having a discussion, and we just need to see God to settle our discussion. And Peter said, right this way, guys. And he took him to God, and they saw God, and God looked at them and smiled and said, Buenos dias, senores. <laughs> you know, we have our way of sort of making God just like us. When God is God. God is, is God. And as the people of God, as the sons and daughters of God, we need to think like our Father. I say that we do God a disservice when we say that he is colorblind. The God who splashed his creation with color and diversity is not himself colorblind. God is colorful. He sees color. He celebrates color. He does, just doesn't favor one above the other. And so we should see color because color exists. We just shouldn't celebrate one above the other and especially as the people of God. Chapter 4, verse 1 begins with the word, therefore. And it points us back to a thought that had begun in chapter 3. Paul ends chapter 3 with a prayer, but early on he talked about the mystery of God concerning the church. He says, chapter 3, verse 6, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And if this were true of Gentiles coming part of the body of Christ in the, in the eyes of the Jews, it certainly should be true among Gentiles to Gentiles. He goes on to say in verse 10, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Logos. When the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places look at you, do they see the manifold wisdom of God? 
when, when the rulers and authorities, when, when, they, when they see you in operation, do you display the manifold wisdom of God? He says, chapter 4, verse 1, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, beseech you, beg of you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And I do the same to you. I implore you. I beg of you. I beseech you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. You've been called sons, daughters of God. Called to be a part of his family. Called as saints. And so I implore you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling which, which, with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, <clears throat> with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, because there's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to you for your word. Your word is truth. We thank you for this portion where the apostle Paul speaks to these Gentile believers, letting them know that they too were a part of the body of Christ. Let's pray for us today that we would behave like your children. Not just claiming you as father, but embracing you as father and all that that means. And embracing our brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of what color they may be. I pray for this congregation here, that it would be diligent to preserve the bond of unity that has been brought about by the Holy Spirit. We have been faced with the oneness of the body. We each have our share in it. We accept what you have already done. You've not made a mistake. We embrace you. Help us to embrace what you've done. We bless you and we thank you in the strong and matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.